we will move to the um, first discussion of this conference, which is on pathways to achieve the sustainable development goals. We'll be hearing from national governments, scientists, and international organizations on how to maintain this long-term um, vision and um, leverage long-term planning in the context of multiple crises to achieve the goals. So let me welcome our distinguished panelists. Um, first, I would like to invite on stage um, State Minister, uh, Mr. Abdoulaye Bio Chane, Minister uh, in Charge of Development and Coordination of Governmental Action. Monsieur le Ministre, je vous invite à me rejoindre uh, sur l'estrade. Please, if everybody could take a seat, that would be great. We will move to the next session of the conference. Um, then I would like to invite Mrs. Lamia Kamal Shawi, director of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, regions, and cities. I would then like to invite Mr. Obijon Kakimov, vice advisor to the president of the Republic of Uzbekistan and director of the Center for Economic Research and Reform under the administration of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. We will have in principle online, if she can get connected, Mrs. Simona Marinescu, Senior Advisor for Small Island Developing States at UNOPS. And uh, last but certainly not least, I would like to invite Mrs. Shirin Malikpour, Associate Professor at Monash University and member of this very important group, this independent group of scientists that just released the Global Sustainable Development um, Re Report 20, uh, 2023 uh, a few days ago. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite um, State Minister Chene to um, kick us off with a keynote uh, intervention uh, on uh, the progress and the strategies that Benin has put in place to achieve the SDGs. And for context, Benin was the first African country in 2021 to issue uh, a financial instrument at the sovereign level, an SDG bond, to finance long-term progress for the SDGs. Monsieur le Ministre, c'est à vous. Thank you very much, Mr. Guillaume. Ladies and gentlemen, Jess uh, has left, but I would like to you know, salute him for his work as professor, but also as leader on SDGs. A friend from the uh, panel, ladies and gentlemen, Halfway toward the deadline of the SDGs, it is now possible to get a precise idea of the trajectory that allows us to achieve them. In our discussion today, I would like to propose that we consider such trajectory as the continuation of all the activities that lead, to, that lead us to the SDGs. It's also often said, and I quote, all roads lead to Rome. But what the thinker misses to tell us is how soon. Regarding SDGs, time is an important impediment, and therefore we cannot take just any path. It is precisely this time constraint that justifies the relevance of this exchange, of this discussion we're having today. While I believe it's relevant to talk about it, at the same time, I think it's been pertinent or pretentious to do so. Of course, it's pretentious to talk about it because when it comes to the SDGs, we are all learners. No one has yet fully succeeded to be lecturing others. On the other hand, the nuance, as well as the positive point, is that many are doing well in certain areas and we could effectively learn from each other. And as a result, by tracking these successes, 
In the various SDGs, we should be able to map out a trajectory that will lead us to be refining over time. It is this, therefore, these successes, these good practices whose promotion and will be beneficial to the SDGs. An important point on the road is the vision or planning that carries the ambition of achieving the SDGs. There is a quote that says, and I quote, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So everything starts with good planning. It put the SDGs at the heart of a strategic framework, provide for the necessary reforms and investment, and define the appropriate programmatic monitoring and evaluation framework. When we arrived at the Ministry of Planning and Development in 2016, some were surprised that our government took six to seven months to define our strategic framework and program. This planning involved, among other things, the prioritization of the targets, the localization, the appropriation, and the costing of the objective to be achieved. Public opinion pressed us, and this impatience was justified, as there was so much to do. But we took the time to do some good planning because we agree with Nelson Mandela that, in a quote, a vision that is not accompanied by action is only a dream. An action that does not stem from a vision is wasted time. Vision which is followed by action can change the world, end of quote. Consequently, in Benin, we identified that seven fundamental changes or trans transformation should drive our ambition to achieve the SDGs. Those transformations relate to the field of energy, digital, industry, education, health, gender equality, and demographics. Let me please elaborate on them. First, as far as the energy transition concerns, this energy transition concerns all countries on Earth. Benin is stepping up its effort to ensure sustainable and affordable access to electricity for the entire population, with an energy mix of 30% by 2026. The installation of solar power plants and the promotion of off-grid electrification are core to this transition. Second, when it comes to digital transformation, it starts with the availability of the infrastructure. That is why Benin has placed particular emphasis on the nationwide coverage of the fiber optic. We develop digital users and the skills needed to support the country's digital ecosystem. This is through the creation of a school on digital themes, as well as the development of Seme City, a smart city project located in Benin, with the objective of becoming a regional pool of excellence in the higher education sector. The government itself is setting, up, is setting a good example with the implementation of intelligence administration projects, which aims to digitalize and dematerialize all procedures within the public administration. In addition, Benin in recent years has put the fight against cyber crimes at a national issue level. A special call dealing with these crimes is operational. The idea is to secure digital activity and thus promote services and users that are likely to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. Third, in terms of in tran industrial transi trans transition, Benin is currently developing one of the largest special economic zones in West Africa, the GDIZ. The idea is to create a learning platform and reduce infrastructure gaps to enab enable rapid industrial, industrial growth, along with the creation of more than 300,000 direct jobs. Fourth, decent work can only be promoted if a profound transformation of the education system becomes a reality. Employment is the primary means by which public policies can lead to the eradication of poverty. This is what Benin has understood by making efforts 
to develop technical and vocational education and training to increase its share from 10% today to 70% in 2030. Six, five, sorry. The other important step is gender equality. Benin has made the commitment to making a very rapid transition from a situation relatively unfavorable to women to a situation where they are fully and perfectly integrated into the country's political, economic, and social decision-making process. To this end, a series of reforms have increased the proportion of women in parliament from 7% five years ago to 27% today. The National Women's Institute has been renovated to promote gender equality in all its aspects. A new family code was adopted to better protect women and harassment in all its forms is converted and a special court is set up to deal with these cases. Finally, countries, particularly those in sub-Saharan Africa, must further work to realize a democratic dividend. We have a large and young population which is still largely underutilized and does not yet participate sufficiently in the productive fabric. The search for demographic dividend and subsequent investments must lead us to strengthening human capital, better engaging women in the country's development process, and improving the delivery of public services in general in all countries. In this context, a national conference on population growth and the country's development is planned for next November with the objective to reach in a consensual manner, the main orientation that must drive family planning in the strict sense as well as in the broad sense for better and responsible parenting. These are some critical steps in Benin's trajectory towards the SDGs. I hope that these are aspects that could inspire public policy in some of the countries. The real challenge is to be able to stick to this trajectory. Emergency, emergency sometimes trumps up over what is important as emergency or shocks related to health, economic situation, security, or political issues can drive countries away from what is important. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that we are committed through investment and reforms to put Benin at the forefront of the best performers of the SDGs. But in such an integrated global world, we need the same commitment from others, particularly from other countries and development partners. That's why I'm happy to be here today, and I thank you. Monsieur le Ministre, merci beaucoup. Uh, de nous avoir uh, fait un lancement parfait. Thank you so much for kicking us off um, so well, and congratulations, of course, for all the efforts that Benin is doing to implement this agenda, and in particular, um, for Benin's pioneering role in connecting SDG pathways with uh, financing, um, including through um, its, its SDG bond. I know you have a very packed um, agenda. Um, I believe you need to leave uh, in, a few, in a few minutes, but thank you so much for, for being with us um, uh, today. Um, let's move on to the rest of our panelists. I think we have a great um, representation of different actors that are involved in some way or another in defining pathways to achieve these goals and that are committed to this um, agenda. And I'd like to actually start, because we're talking here, we're at the midpoint, um, and when we speak about implementation um, pathways, um, a key actors are, of course, cities and regions. I think there's obviously an SDG 11 that's dedicated to cities and region, but there's also, I believe, two thirds of the goals, that's one of the estimates that have been pulled out, that um, two thirds of the targets, actually, that won't be achieved without the involvement of cities and regions. Lamia at the OECD, you've been doing phenomenal work in tracking progress 
of cities and regions um, on this agenda. And not only this, but also looking at how cities have been incorporating the SDGs into public um, policies um, and, and planning and, and monitoring. So can you tell us what are some of the, the conclusions at the midpoint of this work? And then I'd love to hear from you also, because we're here to talk pathways, but pathways without the financing needed to um, implement the investments um, that are needed to achieve the SDGs is, is, is not enough. So can you tell us also about, a, a bit about the conclusions of the work of the OECD when it comes to financing the SDGs in cities and regions? Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here at the Columbia University with students. I see a couple of students in the room. I love to talk with students because, you know, they remind me what are the realities. They are always challenging us. You know, in this discussion on uh, SDGs, we really have to remind that cities and regions are very important actors. And by the way, the president of uh, the Republic of Congo mention of one of his pillars was, was to go really uh, local and regional. He was mindful about the question of spatial inequality. So at the OCD, we have a dedicated department that is looking at the role of cities and regions in doing a lot of things, including in advancing the SDGs. And Stefano Marta, who is now taking a photo of me, so I have to behave, <laughs> um, is the head of this program. So what we have been doing, we have been First, doing what we do the best at the OECD is to create indicators and measurement framework. We need the data, we need to have stats, we need to understand better what is going on. So we have produced uh, what we call a localized indicator framework for SDGs. Uh, we look at all the SDGs, not only this SDG number 11, because we believe that cities and regions are relevant for all the SDGs. And we have created a web tool and by the way, any of you coming from any cities in the world, you go on the website, you type the name of your city, and you can see how your city fare vis-a-vis -vis the national average to achieve the, uh, the SDGs, for, for all the SDGs, but also how it fares vis-a-vis -vis the peers. So this, this was the starting point. We have been able to do that for uh, 600 cities and 600 regions from OECD countries, plus Argentina and Brazil. Now we are emerging the, the sample to other countries. And in parallel, we have been using this uh, result to work really with a uh, you know, number of cities. We produce 10 case studies, engaging them in a policy dialogue because they have been using this data to discuss, okay, what we're gonna do now you know, to advance the SDGs. Um, so based on that, I wanna share you a couple of you know, findings where we are today with, uh, with this uh, type of data. The first thing that I, I wanna say is that we have still a long way for many cities and regions to achieve the SDG. I'm talking about the distance, you know? Uh, and it, we have seen, for instance, that 80% of all the regions have not yet achieved the SDGs in any of the 17 goals, and at least 70% of cities have not achieved the uh, 2030 targets uh, in 15 out of the 17 uh, SDGs. And the areas where cities and regions are lagging the most, they are climate, they are bio biodiversity, they are energy and gender. And um, th there is the question of the fact that they have not reached, and then we measure the distance, right? So where are the distance the bigger? Well, we were surprised to see it was about industry and innovation, SDG number nine, number nine and partnership, SDGs number 17. So these are very interesting findings because they can inform a policymaker at local and regional level. And you know that there is a dedicated SDGs for cities called SDG number 11, which looks at issues like housing, transport, uh, inclusive and green growth. And here, you know, all the work that we have been doing show that we have to be very, very careful when we interpret the data the question of, of the pathway to achieve the SDGs. Not all cities and regions are starting from the same point, within countries and across countries. And I give you an example. If you have you know, a region located in a remote uh, rural areas, you know, the, dis the, the problem of transport becomes extremely acute. 
they are much more emitter of CO2 emission because they are using more transport and it's not the case in metropolitan area. Housing, which is part of the SDG uh, 11, has become a crazy uh, crisis in many cities from all around the world. We have seen, we know our data uh, tell us that uh, they, uh, it's 40% higher to, uh, the, the rent is 40% higher in metropolitan area than in non-metropolitan areas. So here, when, you know, they are not starting at the same point. So we have to be very careful about, we have to consider this type of uh, granularity. Now, in terms of policy making, what we have been seeing is that the cities and region, and I'm sure you have been hearing a lot uh, in the discussion here that countries during the pandemic, they were not really, you know, uh, preoccupied to advance the SDGs agenda. And what we have been doing, we have been tracking during the COVID pandemic what cities were doing, and the contrary, they were using even more the SDG framework because they found it as a very useful, uh, you know, a tool. Uh, and now even more for the recovery, they continue, they like, they, they like the tool actually, they, they enjoy it and they use it very effectively. And with uh, SDSN, we conducted a survey, you know, to identify more or less, you know, who are using that. And I give you a, a, just a couple of uh, data, half of the uh, respondents in the survey, cities and regions, they said that they have establish a dedicated strategy or an action plan for the SDGs. And uh, around 40% say the SDGs, um, no, no, they were, well, they were not using it, but they're gonna, they're gonna use it uh, afterward for the recovery. So that's another uh, important thing. Uh, a last point about, you know, the importance of the SDGs. We have also to remember that it's really crucial for local policy makers because it helps address the question of synergies and trade-offs. We know what to do in any individual policy areas. The big problem is how to reconcile the, the, the trade-off. The synergy, you know, we identify if we invest in climate, whether it's gonna uh, be good for also, you know, for people uh, and for firms. But the, the trade-off is when, you know, you have to make a choice between, for instance, equity and the environment, right? And we did a lot of uh, analysis, and one example that I like to, come to to, to mention is, for instance, the city of Bonn, they have a big problem. They use, um, you know, the car use in the city. So they were considering introducing a congestion charging, which is a good instrument to limit, uh, you know, um, traffic uh, in, within cities. But they made, because of the SDG, they, uh, they, had, they were forced to make uh, an assessment to see the potential impact on inequalities. And they found that it was, it would have been too high, so they decided to go for another instrument. So this question of trade-off is essential. Uh, Guillaume, would you like me to say just one word about financing? Please, 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 talk, talk about, to us okay. about financing. <laughs> so about financing, of course, you know, which is here a big subject everywhere, at national, and international level. Yesterday, it was the big topic in the UN General Assembly. So that's the big issue, how to fund the climate transition, how to fund, you know, the implementation of the SDGs. This is a national issue, this is international. At the local level, it's super relevant, it's essential. So on that front, we have been working a lot in the OCD. We have collected the data, I invite you, everything is available online, by the way. I wanted to tell you, you can take anything you want on the website. Here, we have a unique, um, a unique uh, local finance uh, database called the WOFI. It looks like a dog name, but that's the WOFI, World Observatory on Some National uh, Investment and Finance, uh, where you can find any type of indicators. And thanks to the result of this uh, database, we, I'm gonna give you two interesting data around the world. Um, some national government, when you aggregate all the some national government, they are responsible for 40% of public investment. In OECD countries, it's 55%. And when it comes to climate, they're responsible for almost 70% of climate-related uh, expenditures. So this is something that we have to remind because, you know, they are impo very important actors. So if we want to make things happen, we have to count on them. Um, so what we have been doing, we have established a subnational finance clim climate hub Again, I invite you, one-stop shop where you can find anything related to local finance. And the OECD has been very, very active in contributing to the G20 presidency uh, for Indonesia, 
for uh, uh, now uh, India. So I'm always saying we have progressively infiltrated the G20 by pushing this subject about the importance of looking at the local dimension to make sure that ministers of finance, governors of central bank, they recognize the fact that they have to work with cities and for cities in advancing you know, this, this agenda. So what we produce for them, uh, first they endorse a G20 OECD policy toolkit on financing and funding a quality and inclusive infrastructure for cities. I want to remind that you know, we have calculated that there is um, a $15 trillion infrastructure gap now to, uh, to address for, uh, in, 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 in the area uh, for, for cities. And the other thing that is really recent, like just two weeks ago, they endorsed for the first time a report called Financing Cities for Tomorrow, where they recognize the importance to uh, finance cities. They recognize the financial gap. They discuss the different type of instruments. They recognize the fact that cities, they need to have more local revenues and they discuss also the fact that there are some uh, alternative type of local revenues like land value capture because the fiscal uh, environment is very tight. They recognize the importance to provide a conducive environment for cities to leverage private investment because it's not going to be uh, all public. So there are many interesting recommendations and there was, there was one point that, that we wanted to put in the report that we are pushing very hard is when we talk about funding or financing, it's not only about money. It's about having really good urban planning tool because if you want to, have, to leverage private investment, you need to demonstrate that behind you have you know, a serious urban planning, mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a, a you know, framework, you have master plan you, that can provide some stable, predictable, transparent, indication for the private sector that is really essential. I'm going to stop here. Yeah, that's fine, uh, Lamia. Thank you so much. But um, I was just thinking on your last point, I think this is the key, this combination of those long-term plans, pathways that can then be backed by the adequate financing that's needed to uh, implement them. Thank you so much for uh, highlighting the specificities also of the financing challenges faced by cities and the need to integrate those conversations, especially at the midpoint now on the SDGs, in those international discussions, including at the G20, possibly also at the next COP in Dubai um, as well, and in all those international discussions where the question of financing is, is getting picked up. And I really encourage everyone to go take a look at the, the work that your team has been doing on uh, tracking the SDGs, including those um, very interactive data portals that the OECD has developed. I think another interesting point is what you mentioned about how much the SDGs have been picked up by a number of local leaders and regions, even though those goals initially were actually um, developed um, and applied at the country uh, level. So there's been a lot of efforts also, if we look at the positive side of things over the first seven, eight years on the SDGs, to translate those goals also at the, at the local um, level. Um, we're gonna move up one, level up, go, go to the national level with, uh, with uh, Mr. Kakimov. First, I, I don't think we will have uh, Simona Marinescu connected. She had to join a panel with two under secretary uh, generals, so unfortunately she won't be able to join us, but Simona was supposed to speak about the specific challenges of small islands um, developing states, um, which are of course not responsible or um, very little responsible for the global warming, but that are uh, paying uh, very serious consequences um, for this. So unfortunately, Simona will not be able to, to join us, but that's a good opportunity for me to, to mention that this is a hybrid event, so we have hundreds of people also connected um, online with us today. So, Mr. Kakimov, um, Uzbekistan is also one of the countries, and I think that must um, be, be mentioned, that also pioneered um, those um, innovative financing instruments for sustainable development. Um, Uzbekistan issued a, an SDG bond. Um, I believe the inaugural issuance was in 2021. Yes. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about um, this SDG bond, but also why this is an important financial instrument um, to accelerate SDG progress um, in your country, uh, Uzbekistan? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I uh, say thank you for University of Columbia for organizing such 
you know, the important event. Uh, good morning, dear participants at this high level event. So I would like to say that this year we, uh, you know, the marked halfway past to the SDGs and uh, as 170 countries in the world, Uzbekistan also, uh, you know, the, became part of this, you know, the big action. So we also in 2018 uh, accepted, uh, set the 16 SDG goals and uh, 127 specific indicators in order to achieve SDGs. I'm not gonna talk much about all indicators 16, but I will talk about the, some important ones so that the big changes happened. So uh, since 2017, I would like to mention that, you know, the, the, especially this goal number one, poverty eradication, Uzbekistan made significant changes. For example, let's say in 2020, the president of Republic of Uzbekistan uh, announced that the poverty eradication as the main government policy direction in Uzbekistan. And uh, we uh, first accepted uh, you know, the poverty measurements. We first set the national poverty line. And uh, you know, the, now we are working on multidimensional poverty indicators. And uh, as you can see that when we talk about innovations, you know, especially achieving SDGs and the, or in poverty directions, I would like to mention one innovation in Uzbekistan which was established like uh, since last two years. So the working at the community level, you know, the setting the responsible people for poverty eradication and entrepreneurship programs at the community level gave significant results in poverty reduction. So they start working at the household level. They, work it, they worked with each household, de depending on each household's demands, yes? And uh, this kind of, you know, the helped us a lot. So as returning to your question, SDG bonds, yes, in 2021, we issued $325 million worth of, you know, the sovereign bonds. So as you can see that these SDG bonds were very important in fighting or in achieving, so these SDG, uh, you know, the goals. So when we looked at the analysis of this, you know, the, where we spend this money, it contributed to 11 SDG goals, yes? If you look to the regional distribution, almost all 14 regions benefited from this one. So if you look to the large portion of these SDG bonds, where it's going, it's going to the transportation sector, health sector, education sector, where kind of, you know, the key important areas of development process. So one more thing I have to mention that in this case, so the recent IMF study says that in order to achieve until 2030, Uzbekistan needs about 7.9% GDP additional fundings. So the large portion of these fundings goes to the 3.4%. This is for health sector and 2.4% is the infrastructure and 1% for water infrastructure. So as you can see that Yes, Uzbekistan made significant development in uh, achieving the SDG targets. So we are on the track, but we still need this 7.9%. So this innovative financing, and especially if you compare the 2021, you know, the market risks and the interest rates and the right now, so that it creates significant challenge, not only for Uzbekistan, but also for all other developing countries who struggled during the last two, three years pandemic and other kind of political events, which kind of, you know, the interrupting, interrupting our, you know, the economic development processes. So I think that, you know, the more and more funding, more and I would like to mention that more and more long-term concessional funding for developing economies will be more and more demanded in the near future in order to achieve our SDG goals. Right, well, thank you so much for uh for describing a little bit what Uzbekistan has been doing to connect its planning efforts with access to um, financing. Um, looking ahead at the next couple of years, what are some of the specific um, challenges and priorities for um, Uzbekistan to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs? And maybe to help me a little bit make the segue with the next speaker from the science community, how does the the, the, the government of Uzbekistan partners also with you know, scientific uh, institutions and with, with science uh, at large when it comes to implementing this, this agenda. Definitely, you know, 
uh, when you are in development process. So the basically development is about the productivity. Productivity is based about like what science. So that's why you know the government of Uzbekistan closely cooperates. And one of the main challenges in these next, for example, let's say the decade for all developing economies, it will be human capital. So for example, developing the human capital, scientific development, innovative development will be kind of most important part of the you know the development process. As you know, this artific developmental artificial intelligence you know creates more and more challenges for us. For example, uh, when you say that what will be our uh, you know, upcoming challenges for the development, I would like to mention that if, if anyone doesn't know about the Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan is located in the Central Asia. So Central Asia, uh, kind of, you know, the, it's between the two rivers, Amudarya and the Sirdarya. What I would like to think that in the next 10 years, the biggest challenge, not only Uzbekistan, of the all Central Asia, will be water issues. Because, you know, the global climate change, it's reducing the global, you know, the water uh, uh, supply. For example, let's say a uh, recent study of uh, our center with the Berlin Economics, for example, let's say, uh, it will create additional challenges, not only cutting the water, it also creates what environmental damages also. So additional to this water scarcity, so we have a neighbor, which is uh, Afghanistan. Yes, Afghanistan is also kind of, you know, the uh, tries to, uh, you know, the, create this new uh, canal, Koshtepa, it's called. And uh, if this canal will work, so this, the, the, the Amudarya Basin River, uh, the, the level of this Amudarya Basin River up to the, if, if it goes up to the third level, it will be decreased up to the 30%. As you can imagine that this 30% decrease in the water supply, it will create, first of all, significant decrease in the value added in agriculture sector. Second, huge unemployment sector. Third, we will lose lots of lots of arable lands. So this will create another challenge for the food security. So that this will be another challenge for the food, food security. Another issue I would like to mention that it's the energy efficiency. Yes, so the region is, can be fully energy autonomous because region has lots of energy resources. But at the same time, we have commitments before the Paris Agreement to cut our energy emissions and Uzbekistan committed. So until 2030, increase renewable energy sources up to the 40% of its energy supply. So the, another one is like kind of, as we mentioned, the, the recent political, you know, the tensions uh, creates kind of, you know, the challenges for the transportation channels. So the recent announcement yesterday, and you know, at the presidential meetings, Central Asia plus, you know, the United States, President of the United States also mentioned that, you know, the, this Trans-Caspian transit channels will be more important. And uh, in order to develop this one, it requires more and more investments, especially these investments will be coming from developed nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Abidjan. Also for, uh, yes, I think we can give him a round of applause and congratulations to Uzbekistan for, uh, for all its efforts to implement this, uh, this agenda. Thank you also for highlighting the importance of partnerships, global, regional, with neighboring um, countries so that we, we work together to implement um, those goals. Okay. Let me now turn over to you, Shirin, and already I can congratulate you for the release of the Global Sustainable Development Report 2023. I believe you were the lead authors for chapter three on the pathways to achieving the SDGs. Yes. Good to have you here on the session, but also chapter four on yes. accelerating um, transformations. So, um, can you first, I mean, this is probably related to the chapter three of, of, of the report, but can you summarize a little bit for us when we look at the, the models that are available out there on you know, the potential SDG um, scenarios and the, the projections, what are those models telling us? And what are some, maybe of, some of the biggest opportunities um, when it comes to making rapid gains, rapid gains on the SDGs based on these um, scenarios. 
Sure, so maybe just for the audience, uh, if you're not really familiar with the Global Sustainable Development Report, I can just say a few words uh, what it is. So it's a science policy report that is uh, produced now by an independent group of 15 scientists who are appointed uh, by the UN Secretary General every four years uh, to produce the report. So we had uh, one report back in 2019, and, and this is the second report in 2023. And it was meant to also work as uh, sort of like an input into the SDG summit, which we had um, uh, on Monday and Tuesday uh, under the auspices of the General Assembly and, and really inform uh, the political declaration that came out of that summit as well. Uh, so uh, in the report, as you say, in uh, one of the chapters, we talk about scenarios and scenario modeling exercises, really looking at what has happened uh, in scenario modeling across the world uh, uh, to really try to understand um, the SDG outcomes and also understand what policies and interventions really work uh, for the SDGs. Um, one of the key findings of this scenario literature that was particularly interesting to me is that um, basically on a business as usual trajectory, we are not going to achieve any of the SDGs by 2030 or even by 2050. So you know there, there are some discussions here and there you could see you know some people say oh maybe the 2030 deadline is just too, too soon, too short and we are really uh, only have seven years left to um, get there and maybe we should move the deadline back, shift the deadline back a couple of decades and, and then maybe we can work with that. But um, the scenarios are showing that if you shift the deadline nothing is going to change. Uh, what is going to change, actually, is a shift in uh, policies, a shift in the way governments, but also other societal actors, organize themselves around the SDGs, and also a shift in the way financing and investments work and are, are reoriented towards achieving um, the SDGs. So I was really pleased when I heard also this morning by the President of Congo, and he was also talking about, you know, there is partly that international financing that we are talking about, but also really about how national and local um, uh, resources could be mobilized and could be reoriented towards achieving the SDGs. So to your question about some of the, you know, rapid gains based on this scenario literature, um, it is, uh, there is no silver bullet. So there is no such a thing that you can do one thing and then you will have a rapid gain. Um, it, uh, interventions and things that work uh, vary across different SDGs and also vary across different contexts. Uh, but one thing that we know for sure is that we always need a mix of different interventions in place. Um, so some of the things that, for example, some of these mixes that work is that in the human development space, for example, you know, a mix of investments in um, health, in public infrastructure, in education, um, actually get us really quick gains on um, uh, human development goals. For example, one study showed that doubling investments in these areas would lift uh, more than 100 uh, million more people out of poverty by 2030. Um, or on environmental uh, goals, so the mixes that work really well are carbon pricing, mm -hmm. uh, phasing out fossil fuels, EV mandates, uh, but also really looking at uh, shifting um, lifestyles towards more sustainable diets, for example. So these are the things that we know work, but really the tough questions are about implementation of, of these um, uh, interventions. Uh, because we know that a lot of these interventions involve very um, sensitive political navigation and, and highly contested political uh, issues are involved in these. Uh, but also uh, they involve um, reorienting investments, as I said before, and also for all of us as citizens, as people, uh, really changing lifestyles. And these are really, really tough issues, and that's why I think that um, sometimes, um, you know, the kind of scenario modeling that we are seeing now, which is happening very much at the global level, is very useful for giving us that perspective for global governance and what needs to happen at the global scale. 
but also a lot of national scale um, modeling exercises is needed on the SDGs. And, and currently we are seeing um, very, very few of that. One was done actually in Australia where I'm from uh, by my colleague Cameron Allen and, uh, and others really looking at what works in the Australian context because I think we really need to get to the specifics and that is not possible really when you look at the global uh, scale scenario modeling exercises. And um, what Lamia mentioned around, you know, um, we know that, you know, what works in a particular sector, but when, when you start looking across different sectors and across the different SDGs because of those synergies and trade-offs that all involved, uh, a lot of the uh, problems arise actually there. And again, national scale scenario modeling really gets us to those specifics and let us think about those synergies and trade-offs in a particular context. Uh, considering some of the existing policies and, and capacities that are in place and, and uh, can show us some um, more useful pathways for accelerated action in the next seven years. Fascinating and I, you know, as, <clears throat> as always, the, the GSDR is such a great um, resource to understand, you know, the state of scientific um, evidence and the literature on the, the, the SDGs. Um, we've been talking a lot about financing as one of the big lever for accelerated action. I believe in the GSDR, another lever that's very much discussed is the role of innovation um, as a potential accelerator of uh, progress on the SDGs. Um, you discuss in chapter four this, this concept of the S curve for innovative um, ideas. Um, I'd like you to talk to us a little bit about what might be some of the, 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 the levers that can be further leveraged to accelerate the emergence and acceleration of innovations, because I think there's maybe some good news um, here building on what has happened over the past um, couple of years that where we might be able to, to build on this to accelerate progress. Yeah, so um, the scenarios what I was just talking about really tell, tell, tell us about the what, right? What uh, needs to be done, what interventions and policies might work, and what type of outcomes could be achieved with different policies and interventions. The s curve that we present in the following chapter in the GSDR uh, tells us about the how. Uh, it uh, provides a temporal view on how transformation processes evolve over time. Uh, it, and it can be used as a very useful heuristic, if you like, um, uh, to really analyze where we are at in the transformation process and, and where we want to get to, and in order to do that, what needs to be done. And, and thinking really strategically about managing and navigating this transformation process over time. Uh, so what is the S-curve? Um, the S-curve basically um, uh, says that transformation processes typically go through three distinct phases. If you think about the S-shape, the first, the first phase, the bottom of the S, is the emergence phase. This is where new technologies, innovative behaviors, sustainable practices start to emerge. Um, after some time, these uh, innovations could kind of like join forces, get stronger, mature, and then uh, through targeted uh, interventions, decisive actions, uh, targeted policies, or sometimes triggered by you know, crisis events or things that might happen in the external environment, um, these uh, innovations could actually scale up and, and become widely adopted. So this is the, the, the steep part of the S, if you like and they become widely adopted. This is where we are in the acceleration phase. And finally, the top of the S uh, is where these innovations start to stabilize. They become the new normal. They become embedded in our institutions. Uh, now, this is, of course, uh, a highly stylized model of how the transformation works, and it glosses over a lot of the dynamics that are involved in the process, but it is a still a useful tool for us to, to really think about the transformation process. And one of the usefulness of it is actually in thinking about levers, or what you were asking about the levers. Um, because it, it, it also tells us, because transformation goes through these different processes, you actually need different levers in different stages of transformation. 
so again, we heard here uh, today that um, you know different um, cities, Lamia was mentioning, are in different stages, uh, and they have different distances and different starting points also. And, and um, this is again one of the ways that the S curve can be used to really think about what sector in what geography is in which stage of the transformation. And then in order to move to the next stage, what are the things that are needed? So we know that these levers need to change as you go through this process. For example, in the emergence phase, the kind of things that work are you know, investments in R&D, um, piloting, prototyping, experimentation, and sharing the learnings from these experimentations. But you cannot get too far just by doing that. If you actually want to get to the acceleration phase, this is where you need uh, really decisive actions by governments shaping markets, uh, you know, setting targets, setting standards, regulating business, and for, uh, you know, again, the civil society really uh, building coalitions and, and advocating strongly for, for change and holding governments to accountable for that process. And of course, in the stabilization phase, again, you need capacities for maintaining the outcome so that you, know, you, you don't face a backlash, for example, or, or, or things can be, uh, before they're uh, completely embedded and institutionalized, they can just um, you know, uh, go out of the way uh, suddenly. So, so this uh, curve really helps us also think about these levers in a more strategic way and, and try to really uh, change uh, the way we target uh, issues and we navigate transformation based on where we are at in the process. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much. There's this and, and much more in the Global Sustainable uh, Development Report, but congratulations again to you and all the co-authors of this year's DSDR. Really a great um, resource. So it's going to be time to the time to close this uh, panel. Um, we've heard um, we started from the city level, then to the national level, then to more the global level and what uh, scientists have to say on uh, pathways. So please um, join me with a big uh, round of applause for our panelists today. Thank you.